being here tonight and uh, enjoying this really cool interview. So my name is Jordan Travis, and I know some of you know me, uh, and uh, uh, my kind of thing is building stronger communities, uh, uh, providing top-notch education, and of course also creating uh, great opportunities and experiences all to do with music and singing. And tonight, uh, we're going to be providing you with a ton of top-notch education. Uh, I have a very, very special guest with me tonight who has three degrees from the University of Toronto. She did her Bachelor of Music in Vocal Performance and then uh, took a little bit of time off. Uh, took about 10 years off, didn't do a lot of singing, but then started to really uh, start to teach singing and wanted to learn a lot more. And I guess she did. She went back uh, and did her Master's of Music uh, and then her Doctor of Music uh, as well in vocal performance, specializing in vocal pedagogy. And in 2013, after uh, some years of TAing uh, the undergrad class in vocal pedagogy uh, with Lorna McDonald, in 2013 she actually started to teach that class at the University of Toronto. And at the same year was the recipient of the National Association of Teachers of Singing, NATS, Foundation's Voice Pedagogy Award, which is pretty prestigious and pretty cool. And then a year later, since 2014, she's instructed vocal pedagogy at Wilfrid Laurier University. And in the same year was invited to present uh, and teach at the International Congress of Voice Teachers in Brisbane, Australia, uh, which is incredible. What a great opportunity. And I get to speak to her tonight, which is awesome, with a lot of your fantastic questions. By the way, if you do have any questions throughout this interview, uh, please put them in. And please welcome our very special guest, Dr. Shannon Coates. Hello, how are you Hello. doing? Hello, I'm well, thanks. How are you? <laughs> Fantastic. It's wonderful to uh, see you. We've had a couple chats this week, and mm -hmm. it's just it's always great to put a face to to either emails or a face to a phone. So it's it's great to kind of be here tonight and uh, celebrate the voice. Yeah, I love it. Thanks for that intro. Woo. It's very fancy. <laughs> well, it's all you. You've done some pretty amazing I mean, I things. I, yeah. <laughs> I guess it's me, but still, it's, it sounds pretty fancy. <laughs> so I think that we also have, uh, other than, than U of T, uh, uh, I think we have another thing in common of loving mm. really good coffee. I, I think oh. we love really, like, really good coffee. I do love really good. That's hilarious. I do love really good coffee. And you want to know something interesting, sort of. I didn't start drinking coffee until I was in my early 40s. Really? Mm -hmm. Oh, my goodness. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like I'm a bit of a lifer, you know? Uh <laughs> well, I'm dedicated now. Let me tell you, I'm committed now. <laughs> I love but yeah, enough. I didn't start for a, until I was, uh, you know, a little, little later. I mean, early 40s, it's only like last year, but still. <laughs> and so before we get going, um, how, how have you been kind of dealing and processing all of this information? I mean, you're, you're teaching in universities and suddenly, of course, everywhere is, is closed. I, I know you do a lot of online stuff. And a bit later, we're going to talk about your online program, which is mm -hmm. phenomenal. But how, are you, how have you been dealing with all of that? Ah, well, um, yeah, great question. The class that I was teaching this year at the University of Toronto, um, the undergraduate voice pedagogy class, we, I transitioned them online uh, the, the Friday before the university closed down. So we sort of saw it coming and I thought, you know what, I, I am comfortable teaching online and I'm comfortable delivering lectures online. Well, let's just throw this thing online. So the folks who were in that class, the students were in the middle of their teaching project. So in other words, they were teaching one-on-one -on -one, uh, oh, voice lessons, yeah. So they had uh, the opportunity to teach online. So the folks who took that class, um, not only did they get all the opportunity to teach, which I think is a real strength of the University of Toronto's program, and uh, thanks to Lorna McDonald, actually, that she set that up that way. 
um, and also because we have TAs there who, who can help to deliver that program. Um, so they not only did they have the opportunity to teach and to learn how to teach and have this their first teaching experiences under mentors and guided teaching experiences, but they got to teach online. So, uh, and now, you know what, honestly, uh, you know, and, and we, you know, we did their, their final exams online, which is a teaching exam as well. So we had their teaching mentor, myself, they were there and then their student was there. So they did, I mean, everything online. It's really fantastic. Um, and you know what? I am including, that's going to be part of the, the teaching project next year. Whether, whether we have to be online or not, they're going to have to teach three of their lessons online. I think that's a fabulous idea. And yeah. uh, I also love the fact, like, with a lot of these programs, depending on the program you use, you can record things so that it's easy to share Absolutely. that, right? And, Absolutely. I mean, it's fantastic. Yeah, and that was, I mean, there were there were a few, there is always that issue of, you know, who has Wi-Fi and some, some people are going home to, you know, like when they go to their parents' farm out in the middle of nowhere or whatever, right? Like some people don't have the same quality of Wi-Fi, of course. So there were some issues that way, but, uh, but that is one way we got around it is they recorded their uh, lessons and then we assessed their lesson separately. Their teaching mentor and I um, assessed the lesson separately because, awesome. yeah, because we have the ability to record it. Yeah, absolutely. It, you know, it just, to evaluate and, and to make sure yeah. that things are working and yeah. So yeah, it was when right. I chatted with you like earlier in the week. I mean, we I know you as a, a vocal pedagogy specialist, and mm -hmm. I think a lot of people here probably know you in that. That but when we were chatting, you mentioned that you kind of have like three streams that you focus yes, on in terms yeah. of your work, and I'd love you to to tell everyone about them because I think that's important that it's it's not yeah. just what you're doing at the university level. Yeah, absolutely. So yes, I work with voice teachers primarily, and I also work with voice users. So that includes obviously, uh, you know, singers and professional singers and, uh, and aspiring professional singers in all styles. Uh, but I also work with voice users such as teachers, uh, pastors, preachers, lawyers, those kinds of folks who use their voice for a living and who cannot make money if they can't use their voice. And the way that I work with those, with that sort of that population is, um, first of all, I develop resources. You mentioned earlier the uh, online course of the Vocal Instrument 101. There are several yeah. things like that. Obviously, I have a fairly um, persistent online presence. So you can follow me on Facebook at the Vocal Instrument 101. And there's lots of, lots of content there. I love doing lives. So there's always some information coming out that way, as well as on, on, you know, Instagram and, you know, my mailing list and all that stuff. So there's, there's always information, blog, blah, 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 um, as well as classes. So there, uh, I also have classes that you can purchase and all that stuff. So the sort of getting the, the information out, just dispersing information. That's the, the one way that I work in developing resources for teachers and voice users. Um, the other way that I work is in uh, delivering content in a class format or in a lecture format or a workshop or a masterclass or a seminar. Right now they're all webinars, but you know, it's fine. <laughs> it's totally fine. And that's for, you know, large groups of people, choirs often have me in to talk about vocal health or singing well into your later years and singing healthily, yeah. or, you know, and I often, uh, you know, talk voice, um, health and hygiene. In fact, the University of Toronto started to do this a couple of years back now, um, which, you know, I think is brilliant. Uh, they started to have a health and hygiene um uh, sort of mini seminar, just a couple of hours long at the beginning of each year for the entire voice faculty and incoming voice students. Uh, so every, yeah, so you come into, so that way when I get them in third year voice ped, they're not surprised by some of the vocal health information. <laughs> we want them to have that vocal health information from year one, you know, and sometimes hydrate with water <laughs> yeah yeah but so hopefully that information is clear but some of the other information you know that doesn't always get covered in lessons right it just, you don't always have time to to make sure that they have the information they need um as well as you know talking to so voice users about 
how you use your voice and the way that you're using your voice, what you're actually saying and what I hear when you use your voice and how can you use your voice, optimize your voice to communicate better, all that kind of thing. Um, and then I work one on one uh, in a different way than a traditional voice studio. So I work more uh, along the lines of a coach where we're working on results uh, based outcomes. So what do you want to do? What do you want to learn? Where what what information do you need? And let me put together a package so that you get all of the information you need in the way that you like to learn it. There are lots of people out there who prefer not to read books. And that's so it's cool. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely yep. fine. I can put something together for you that involves zero reading. <laughs> no problem at all. <laughs> so yeah, that kind of work. But that's, 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 that's fantastic. And um, <laughs> it, it sounds like it's, uh, it encompasses so many different areas of, of basically education. And it sounds like that's kind of your thing. Yeah. Like how can I teach other people to yeah. teach voice at a really great level? You know, that that's wonderful. Yeah. Now, we, yeah, we kind of delved into something when, when we were talking, um, and it, it stemmed from uh, it's talking about uh, the, you know, the Singing Instrument 101. Um, it stemmed from mm -hmm. a video that you actually put out fairly recently, believe it or not, and you were talking about, I think it was vowels in particular at that time, but talking oh. about if I was singing classically, this oh, yeah. is what I would do, and if I was singing contemporary. Now, you know, I have... Uh, probably more of my tribe of people are more contemporary, uh, singing more contemporary. And I think that, that probably right now in the world we're seeing more switch to contemporary. But there must be a ton of, like my background is in classical voice and yeah. I know that there's a ton of similarities, but there are some differences. Yeah. And I, I'd love to kind of dig into some of these if that's okay. Uh, Absolutely. And, yeah, and, and kind of, I guess the way I kind of break it down is like each each thing so if I was talking about alignment or if I was talking about um, uh, phonation or resonation or articulation um, what are some of the similarities what are some of the differences and it, it, yeah. if even if you could hit some of the big things I think the listeners would love 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 that so if we're kind of contemporary versus classical um, why don't we start with uh, uh, alignment so like something very right. basic very important but um, I'd love your thoughts on that. Sure, sure thing. And funnily enough, I just finished recording a like 90 minute class on contemporary singing. So <laughs> get on my mailing list if you want to get the information for that. <laughs> I literally just did that today, but um, yeah, so this is, and I'll say too, that this is one of the main things that uh, singers and voice teachers come to me to work on, um, especially if you've been classically trained. Um, mm. So we can start with alignment. Um, uh, let me give you just an overall first. So in yeah. our classical training, we are, we are being trained to optimize everything in the instrument, everything that we're doing with while we create sound, we're optimizing that to be able to be heard unamplified. So everything that we do in classical training is to optimize the sound to be able to be heard unamplified. Everything except classical singing is amplified. So pretty much we pretty much right pretty much these days anyway. Even our legit musicals are amplified nowadays. I mean, it's not yeah, like absolutely. you know, like yeah, Hair almost everything is amplified. Like yeah. Yeah, sure. Sound of Music sure. was totally amplified. It was all, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, totally. So everything that we learn in our classical training and <laughs> just a little telephone there, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's the world. This is real. This is live. <laughs> it's live. It's fine. It's perfect. Uh, yeah. Everything that we learn in our classical training helps us to develop that coordination towards singing unamplified and being able to be heard. Mm -hmm. But that is a, um, that is specific and very challenging to create that coordination. That's why it takes so long to like, you know, if you're, you're a prodigy, if you're at the Met at 25 years old, right? Like yeah, that's absolutely. why it takes so long to develop classical singers is because, you know, we, this is almost unnatural. In a way, it is unnatural, right? It's like the ballet of the dance world or, of you know, we're like the ballet of the op, of the singing world. Is that a thing? Yes. It is now. It is now. You said it. We're, so we're, it we're learning, true. right? Yeah, I said it. So we're learning something that is contrary in a way to what we would do just if we were left to our own devices and naturally, right? Yeah. So this whole 
pedagogy has uh, come up around classical training because it requires such, such specific training, right? And so then what's come up with that is that we've got this whole idea, especially if we were classically trained or if we were trained by a classically trained singer, we have this whole idea that classical training is good, it's the best, it's the healthiest, it's the like it's the top tier training, all of those things. We have this around it. And like you, and as you said, my degrees are in classical singing. I have two graduate degrees in classical performance specializing in voice pedagogy. I love me some classical singing and I am well trained in it. I know what I'm doing. It's I love it. Do not yeah. get me wrong. It's not this is not what's going on here. What's going on here is that the, the the information that we have in order to sing classically is not necessarily useful in our contemporary styles. So, for example, one of the things that we work on, I, I'm actually going to go the opposite than what you suggested. Yeah, you suggested please. alignment, breathing, blah, blah, blah. You suggested yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to go the opposite. Way. I'm going to go resonance. It. I'm going to go backwards. Yeah, so, go backwards. I love it. Uh, so in our classical training, we're asking our singers to create uh, what we call a convergent vocal track shape. So what we're asking for is, we're asking for lowered larynx, we're asking for open throat, which is pharynx, we're asking for open throat, we're asking for space between the molars, high soft palate or wide soft palate, we're asking for vertical space in the mouth, and we're asking for forward lips. Oh, that's what we're asking for, even in an E vowel. So if I intone E A R O U and I keep my classical convergent vocal tract shaping, which is open at the back and going toward a point at the front, I say E A R O U. And even if I'm in chest voice, meaning even if I'm in the lower part of my range, E A R O U. I still sound like a classical singer, even though I'm in chest voice, right? I sound like a tenor, yeah. but I still sound like a classical singer, right? <laughs> well, because tenors are singing in their chest voice, right? This is, we're still in chest voice when yes. males are singing in their chest voice in classical singing. So we're, what we're doing in contemporary shaping when we're shaping the vocal tract is essentially the opposite. Not always, and of course there are degrees, but when we talk about the 100% the convergent vocal tract shape oh, where we've got wide open into narrowness the other the the divergent vocal tract shape is what we want for for contemporary shaping and oh my gosh i keep showing this side of my head don't look at my hair it's covid hair don't look at it of the quarantine hair right now <laughs> don't look you can only look from the front Anyway, here we go. We got a divergent vocal tract shape. So what we're doing with that then is that comparatively speaking, no style wants the larynx way up in the forehead, of course, but comparatively speaking, we've got the larynx much higher in the throat. So we've got a shorter space. We've got a more narrow throat feeling, especially when we compare it to classical singing. We've got narrowness here. And then we get a horizontal space in the mouth rather than a vertical space in the mouth ha rather than ha and then we get width in the front so we go into this kind of shaping a, a divergent vocal tract shape this way rather than convergent vocal tract shape so when i yeah, so when, it seems when you were referring sorry it just it seems like it's uh, uh more what i would say speech so when you're talking about yes, uh like a wider i think about how i talk normally and the kind of general shaping of my mouth is not, you know, overly manipulated. It's pretty just natural. This is how I would speak. Exactly. Yeah, exactly cool. that. And I mean, the problem comes in when we, uh, as classically trained singers, I mean, my inhalation, my as soon as I do a an inhalation, a deep inhalation, an inhalation for breathing, for singing, all of those things come into place in terms of resonance, right? So I go like, I inhale, I get high soft palate, I get wide throat, I get open throat, I get low larynx, I get space between my molars, I get, that gives me Julia Child, all of a sudden I'm in classical resonance, right? That's, that yeah. shape, my inhalation gives me that shape because I've been well trained as a classical singer. So that's one thing that we have to change is the resonance strategy, what we're doing in terms of what we're, what we're, how we're shaping the vocal tract. But the other thing that we have to change if we've been classically trained is what we trigger when we inhale. What mm. is the, what's our default on our inhalation, right? We've, if we've been well-trained as classical singers, we've been well-trained to 
come to this beautiful alignment, which is not a problem for contemporary singing. It's not. But what it engenders no. is yeah. low larynx. And it engenders this like, whoa, 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 all the way up through the resonance. It also engenders a kind of flow phonation, um, which we, in classical singing, we have vibrancy on every note-ish. We have this uh, legato line. We have this consistency in the release of the breath that gives us this flow sound. Uh, you know, yeah. right, I flow, 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 flow. So the yeah. three things that really have a difference in our contemporary style is we change that flow phonation into more of a, I liken it to, you know, in, in classical singing, we're like blowing bubbles through like soap bubbles. So we have this kind of flow phonation through a wand. Yeah. Whereas in our yeah. contemporary singing, we're kind of blowing bubbles into like old bubble gum. So we have a little bit of resistance which gives us a little bit more of a, a pressurized air because we need it because the vocal folds are changing. But anyway, so we're changing how that air moves through. We get a And if I change my vocal tract shaping now, I get yeah. So I've got there, I've got my flow. I changed my flow phonation. If I yeah. do classical flow phonation, I get yeah. And even though I had contemporary shaping and chest voice, I still sounded wrong because I had flow phonation in there. That's so interesting. <laughs> That's so interesting. Yeah, and I mean, the, the hard part too is, is that different, I mean, contemporary, just like saying classical music and, you know, uh, and knowing that there's, you know, a, a, just a huge yes. swath of, of different styles within that. I think even with contemporary music, you have the exact same thing. So if we're looking at, you know, a contemporary pop artist or country artist, you know, maybe needing different things. Um, some of the style that I sing in terms of contemporary acapella love in terms of these beautiful legato lines. So when we're talking about flow phonation, we love that. Uh, yes. However, the tone model is probably not yes. what we want. So you know, that's the struggle. This is the struggle is we, finding well, what are the similarities? About, what are the, yes. Yeah. And when we're talking about similarities, I like to put things on a spectrum. So I put things on a spectrum in terms of shaping from contemporary to classical shaping, right? So in barbershop, we're actually looking at, at like, we're not all the way over into contemporary. We're likely... No at like 60% classical shaping, probably, right? Yeah. Um, and in and some probably, of our... And it, it probably depends on... It, it, some would depend on the group, some would depend on the taste of, of the, the director or the organization. Um, I think that there's a lot... But I love that, that idea that it's not a... I think so many of us black or white these issues. Yeah. And, and yeah. as opposed to the, having that continuum and saying, hey, it's somewhere on this continuum. I love that, that analogy. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And the, and the flow goes on that continuum as well. And the same thing when we're talking about, um, you know, when we're talking about uh, musical styles, right? So if we're talking about a golden age musical style, that flow is going to be over to like 70% classical, maybe even 80% classical. Yeah. Uh, and same with the, the shaping is likely going to be over there into classical. It's not going to be all the way over to classical, yeah. but comparatively speaking it's likely going to be on that continuum speaking. somewhere absolutely yeah. absolutely yeah. what are some of the other um either big differences or big similarities uh that you kind of pick up from contemporary versus classical so i think the big similarity and uh this is with all kind of all of our styles i think the big similarity is that we are always looking for tension inefficiency um pressed sound you know we're always looking for those things the, the the issue is that if we've been classically trained for example something that is a perfectly acceptable sound in a contemporary style sounds like it's forced absolutely or, pressed or too much tension in our classically trained ears so we are always looking for those things, no matter what the style is. But if you are classically trained, again, you need to you need to do a lot of listening and you need to figure out what the actual tonal outcome is rather than basing it on what you know from classical training because that, your tonal outcome is different. So Absolutely. what sounds so like... It's so, it's so <laughs> tough. I think, um, you know, my experience was totally coming at this from a more contemporary standpoint 
and then kind of studying classically for many years, which yeah. made me feel like everything that I had done before was probably wrong. And then yeah. realize, wait a minute, no, there's there's some things that were right, and there's things that we can apply. Uh, but it, it wasn't people that made me. It was my mind that kind of made me go. It wasn't like somebody said, oh, you're wrong because. It was just, oh, well, I guess this is the right way because it's classical, uh, as opposed to this is one way, uh, yeah. and this is for a very specific niche uh, rather yeah. than, you know, everything. What, yeah. what would you say other than, so you talked a little bit about uh, uh, – basically how we're using our air in terms of flow formation yep. and you were yep. talking about a uh, space uh, basically convergent versus a uh, divergent space are there any other big differences that you'd say uh, between the, the classical and contemporary so there are a couple of things i think uh when if we look at all the various you know sort of aspects of um creating sound in singing I think alignment takes care of itself when we look at some of the other things, obviously, so long as you're not doing crazy things with your body, but um, yeah. alignment, or at least alignment can take care of itself. There's, oh, so many caveats there, but <laughs> alignment can take care of itself um, uh, through intention, but that's a whole other thing. So then we talked about breathing, uh, and then, oh, so phonation, so the actual vocal folds themselves and registration. So. When we're talking about the the differences there, essentially when we're looking at the female voice in classical versus contemporary, in classical, in the female voice, we are looking at a more head dominant sound. These I'm I'm simplifying extremely yeah. a lot right now, but uh, for the sake of you know understanding it, but uh, we're looking for a more head dominant sound. So even when I'm coming down into even though I'm mixing there and I've got some chest voice in there, it's still it's, it's a lot more head dominant oh. than or, or, you know, yeah. headish. Yeah. <laughs> now a lot of that has to do with the way that I'm shaping, of course. But uh, and then and for the female voice, when we're looking in contemporary sounds, we're looking to mix and getting a more chest dominant sound up to where we would normally, you know, in classical voice, we would normally be basically Full head on. voice, right? Yeah. So we're so we're taking that chest dominant sound a lot higher. In the male voice, it's the opposite. So in the male voice in classical singing, we're taking a chest dominant sound up into the upper extension. Uh, as a tenor, we're, we're hoping to have like a high C with a full, you know, the, those fully, I know, I know. So we'll look, that's, maybe, maybe at one point. <laughs> that's the dream. I'd be lucky that's to get dream. a flat these days. But. Yeah. <laughs> that's the dream. So that's what we're looking for, right? As a tenor and as a baritone or as a, a baritone, we're looking for a G or possibly a little higher than that right in our full in the full voice or in your chest voice sound and then in our contemporary sounds we're very happy to mix in head dominant sounds all over the place uh, in contemporary sounds in the male voice we're very happy to have uh you know light mixes and and uh head voice and sounds when you say when you say head voice i i assume you're not necessarily speaking about falsetto uh but i know <laughs> there's <I> know. <laughs> This, you know what? We could probably have an hour-long talk just about this. Let's take it. Let's take it. I mean, the long and the short of that one is that we're talking about, for so long in the voice ped world and still very much prevalent in our world these days, is that we talk about chest voice and head voice as if there are only two ways that the that the voice works, right? We only have this one register and this other register. That's all we got. And, you know, maybe men have like chest voice, head voice, and falsetto, woo. And maybe women have like chest voice, mixed voice, and head voice. Like, it's just not that simple. Yeah. But when I am talking about head voice and the male voice, I am talking about upper register and that in some voices, we know what's happening physiologically in, in falsetto versus head voice when we choose to call it that. But that's very fold oriented. So what okay. is the what are the folds doing? And it doesn't take into account what we're doing with registration. Mm. So I'm sorry, what we're doing with our uh, resonance, what we're doing yes. with the vocal track shaping, the vocal track shaping is where we do get true mix, yes. um, especially in the middle part of the voice. And then, on, uh, you know, as we go toward the extreme, so what we're doing in terms of registration, and, you know, mix, 
really depends on what we're doing here with the vocal tract shaping. But when I'm talking about head voice, I am talking about upper register. Whether you want to call yeah. it falsetto, head voice, whatever. Yeah, yes. I, I always struggle with this too <laughs> because so many, so many people have have used these, and it's kind of been like, uh, uh, yeah, you know, I, I I understand where you're coming from. Absolutely. So in terms of, um, we kind of hit up some big ones. I know one person uh, wrote in, uh, a, a friend of mine from uh, Western United States out in Seattle, uh, was what? asking about apodja breathing. And, nice. and specifically, you know, I know that when my time at the University of Toronto, this was very much what was taught. Um, and in terms, in terms of just uh, uh, basically not allowing that collapse to happen, or at least not uh, kind of, I don't want to say fighting against that collapse, but yeah. fighting against that collapse a little yes. bit. And, and uh, yeah, just keeping that, that wide ribs, you know, <laughs> kind of feel Maintain all the time. It. Yeah, and, and so they were kind of asking this question because uh, they were working with someone who is also a voice specialist. Uh, mm. Now, granted, they're in a chorus set situation where yeah. they don't they can breathe or take breaths anywhere they want. So you can have these long phrases where individuals are taking these little breaths. So uh, they were asking about, you know, do, do we spend the time really working with each individual, focusing on that kind of breathing? Or uh, one of the concepts was, well, if we just don't take in as necessarily as much air, because I think uh, uh, barbershoppers and a lot of singers in general were overachievers, <laughs> and we tend to, like, just tension up the wazoo, right? So we, we take in that breath, and you can, there used to be a term years ago, tank up. You know, and it was like, Ooh, uh, because you'd see all this tension across the upper chest and shoulders. It's horrible. But um, I, I think the concern is, well, if, if we're working on really getting that, those wide ribs going, are people going to overachieve? So if we just take in a comfortably low breath and not really focus more on the efficiency of the folds rather than, I, I don't know if you have a thought on this or uh, yes. you know, both ways can work or... Yes. <laughs> it's uh, basically yes. That's the short answer. The, yeah, we can move on now. The <laughs> long answer <laughs> The long answer is it's nearly impossible that the choral directors have the unique opportunity to deliver a lot of really good information to a lot of people at once. The issue with um, being in front of a lot of singers at once is that singers are never one size fits all. So what works in terms of a poggio and using the kind of breath where, you know, every, it's expansive and it's beautiful and, and they've got beautiful buoyancy on the release and everything is still released, mm -hmm. is that that works for one person in your choir and the other 99 people are, are locking out or locking in or yeah. locking their knees. And it's nearly impossible to really, adjust, uh, you know, really come up with a way to talk about this that works for the whole choir. <laughs> Just okay. it's nearly yeah. impossible. It, it's the one on ones. So, it's the, the small yeah. groups. It's the those that those is going to really pay off in terms of that effort. Yeah. So it feels yeah. like it feels like anything else I'm going to do. It's do no harm. You know, yes. I, I don't want to teach in a way that's going to create more harm. So if someone's yes. taking in a comfortably full breath, they're not really engaging muscles in their chest or shoulders. Hey, this is positive. This is working yes. in the right direction. Yeah. yeah. There are a couple of things that you can do on mass to um, help to keep things um, as you know, uh, moving along as we would like them to. And one is to incorporate movement in your warm-ups, whether you're doing that already. You, many choral directors do anyway, but uh, to incorporate the kind of movement in the warm-up, and I'm just demonstrating while I'm sitting, which isn't working as well as I would like, but there you go. Something like where you're drawing a circle on the floor with your tailbone, or you're creating yeah. a square on the floor with your hips, or you're doing this kind of motion, or you're doing this kind of motion. Anything where you are engendering 
some flexibility between the ribs and the hips. You're engendering folks to remember that there is expansion 360 rather than just out to the front, which is often what we do uh, yeah. as singers. Yeah. You know, we get locked in this open to the front. Yeah, yeah. it's so yeah. easy. So easy. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Anything where we're doing the kind of like one hand in the back, one hand on the side, we're doing inhalations while we're moving. And then we're exhaling while we're moving and we're phonating while we're moving. So incorporating so some explain, kind of movement. Yeah, explain just a little bit about the movement, like why the movement? What is the movement? Mm -hmm. Is it just allowing me to experience that better? Yes, and also showing those muscles the, the muscles that will try to get you locked and will try to help you support. I mean, the body responds to our intention. So if I want to sing well and I want to project my voice, my body is going to, if I don't tell it to do something else and I'm not specific about how I want my body to deliver that sound, my body will do what it can to help me deliver that sound. My body Absolutely. will lock in, my knees will lock in, my hips will lock in, my shoulders will get, my chest will come forward so I can stabilize the larynx and get that sound, get that air moving through my larynx, right? Of course it will intention intent our, our bodies will do what we intend them to do so <laughs> showing the body that we can deliver the same kind of resonance the same kind of sound quality the same kind of intensity in the sound while having complete release in the body through movement so we're giving those muscles that would normally try to help us out we're Please giving them something else to do so they can't i love it yeah i love like, it here's I love the it. movement I mean, and look yeah. <laughs> well, I was going to say, personally, I'm a kinesthetic learner. So this kind of stuff is right up my alley. Uh, and so I'm one of those people where if I can experience it, then I can do it. If I can't, if I'm just trying to, to mentally do it, I'm just not strong enough. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and part of it too is in choirs, we have, we have our, uh, you know, in choirs, we have folks holding folders, standing in this position for quite a long time. You know, I mean, this is, it yeah. is a certainly a, a challenge in the, in the choral situation to Absolutely. make sure that we're allowing that freedom. We really look, we're really looking for that uh, freedom of movement between the ribs and the hips. And we're really looking for the expansion 360 in the ribs. Yeah, that's fantastic. Somehow. That's that's wonderful. Thank you. I mean, I knew that this was going to take up some time, and and we had joked earlier in the week. I said we could probably do like two, three hours or, or days, maybe on classical versus contemporary. But I I think that we hit up some really great points mm -hmm. that are going to help people, and that, that's the main mm -hmm. thing. Like I'd love people to go yeah. away from this going, hey, I've I have uh, some new tools, some new opportunities. So. Kind of down that realm, when, when you were chatting earlier, talking about, um, you know, singing and frequency of singing, and you were you're joking about doing things 40 plus and, you know, things like that. <laughs> and one of the questions that came in uh, from uh, a friend of mine, Sue Melvin, who's, who's uh, in Rochester, and, and Sue was, was asking about um, the voice and specifically, uh, uh, like, how, how much should we be either rehearsing or singing or warming up or exercising our voice on a, on a, like the frequency level? And then how long should we be doing that? And I guess the third last part of the question is, if, um, if we weren't doing that, what will happen? Like, it, it, you know, kind of thing. So, and she, she, she was specifically asking for 40 plus. I don't know that. if that makes a difference. So you can kind of chat about that too, if you want. <laughs> I love that. So the frequency question, um, I'll tell you that that is a common question. That is something folks ask a lot, especially uh, folks who have been long-term choral singers, um, especially just because I want to be able to do this for the rest of my life. How do I take care of my voice so that I can do what I love forever, right? So um, yeah, it's a, it's an excellent question. There are three factors involved here, just like in any other sport. So if we if we sort of compare this to say running a 10K when you're 45 years old, there are three factors involved here. One is how much training did you do in your youth? In other words, how much specific training did you have before things started to settle? <laughs> so in your teens and early 20s, how much training did you have? Specific training, not just singing in choirs. Singing choirs, wonderful, absolutely wonderful. But, but like, how much work do you, yes. So 
how well are those muscles going to respond when you start to do this again or when you start to be more consistent what's the pickup of those muscles what's the muscle memory what's the efficiency in the muscles what's the response going to be the second thing is what do you do with your voice all day long so if you are a lawyer for example if you're a teacher for example if you're a primary school teacher you are using your voice in in one of the most intense ways possible on on a daily basis so there are some habits and some uh, muscle tension patterns that are ingrained in that voice use that you're going to need to target specifically in your work in your singing work in order to make sure that you have this longevity uh and and ability to sing well absolutely yeah uh and then the third factor is um what's your end goal so in in, in this case, I think the end goal is likely I want to be able to sing well into as long as I can and I want to still enjoy it, right? I want to enjoy it and I want to, I want to be able to feel like I'm still able to contribute to a choir, right? I don't want to feel like I'm the one who's like <laughs> dragging the choir down <laughs> or whatever, right? I still want to be able to contribute and, and be part of the choir. So if that's the end goal, working from that end goal and taking those other two things into consideration, my best advice overall and i'll get to specific but the best over advice overall is to get yourself to a voice professional a voice teacher or coach and ask them to come up ask them do a couple of sessions with them just in terms of what you're singing right now tell them what your goals are have them do an intake where they're looking at what you those two factors that i already talked about what your daily voice use is and what your um, early training was and then have them give you or or work with you to come up with a um a singing warm-up regime that addresses your specific things so if you have a if you're specific if you are for example if you're a female lawyer or a litigator your voice may be doing this constantly right you hear that pressure in my speaking voice if i'm doing that for eight hours a day five days a week i've got some serious work to do in my singing voice to bring back the buoyancy and the flow so you want some specific exercises to address that and some specific work to address that having said that if that's not an option do your SOVT exercises so meaning semi-occluded vocal tract exercises do your tongue trills do your v's do your z's do your straws um uh, there's lots of lots of you know videos i've got some stuff on my blog as well there's lots of stuff online about um semi-occluded vocal tract exercise you can't get enough of them humming anything that uh, uh combines one of those kinds of exercises a tongue trill for example with movement and intentional breathing get yourself going with something like that for five to ten minutes a day on a five to seven day basis you can do it every single day you can do it in the shower for 10 minutes where you're doing some kind of this kind of uh movement where you're uh, again you're finding where where in the body you get stuck and that's something that a voice professional can help you with as well uh something you know where where specifically in your body are you locking are your knees the main problem if your knees are the main problem then you might need to do some kind of different kind of physical movement uh or where is the main problem combine that with some kind of breathing that works for you um and again whatever kind of breathing was for you and then put the phonation in then make it through an sovt a semi-occluded vocal tract exercise so semi partially closed vocal tract anything along those lines and then pull some of your rep so whatever your rep is where you are say there's a large jump uh say there's a place where you're running out of air say there's some registration weirdness that you can't quite figure out say there's something uh agility based that's weird or something that's where it's a little bit challenging pull some passages from your rep and make that part of your technical warm-up or your your warm-up and your technique work yes and put that into your lip trills your sovts put it in a straw sing it through a straw 
then put it into a vowel and then put it back into the into your um, whatever the text is all the while doing this kind of work like you're still doing that intentional breathing you're still doing that intentional moving and you're continuing to have that uh, again to show your body what it feels like and teach your body what it feels like to create sound through a released instrument yeah so it's a free uh, you know and I love you keep coming back and using the word intentional and I mm. just love that I, mm. I, I love that I love the fact that you know hey I have to be intentional about this mm. or it's it's not gonna happen it's mm. not gonna happen uh, yeah. your your natural instinct or past <sighs> habits are gonna take yeah. over and uh, you know it, it reminds me of um, uh, what is it unconscious incompetence Right. They, oh. to, uh, con un have you heard this scale before? Oh, I no, love this. Unconscious incompetence is like unconscious. In I'm not thinking about it and I'm messing up. So that's kind of like ignorance. And yes. then you have conscious incompetence. I'm thinking about it, but I still messed up. Conscious oh. competence. I'm thinking about it and I got it. And then unconscious competence, which is the, the, I really, <laughs> I wasn't. How do I not know this? You totally need to know this. So, so this is the whole the whole concept of, of basically creating from a, a bad habit to a good habit, right? And so when you say the word intentional, I love that more than even conscious. I mean, you're intentional, you're thinking about it, you're aware, and you're trying to make it. And by doing that over and over again, it becomes unconscious. You don't have to think about yes. it. It becomes a good habit. But, but I love the term intentional. I, I think that's fantastic. I mean... I think vocal pet is so, so semantics are so important in our game. And I think that, that saying something into that is, is fantastic. So intentional. I love that. Um, love and so what is, I, I mean, I think I, we, we know the answer, but what is the, what is, what if I don't, I'm not able to, or I don't do that every day? Uh, it just sounds like it's just not going to be ready as, as ready for me, like any muscle in the body. Yes, just like any training. Um, and, you know, and again, coming back to sort of training for a 10K, I mean, the amount of training I did for a 10K when I was 25 is going to stand me in good stead if I want to just kind of do a 10K now. It's going to hurt a lot, but I'm going to be better off than someone who didn't. And I'm going to be a lot better off if I do the training now. And if I do the training now and I take like a week off and I run a 10K, it's not going to be great, but it's going to be fine. I'm going to be fine, right? But if I do the, you know, like the, it, the, the, yes, the intentionality around the consistency is also part of the deal. Yeah. <laughs> it gets well, you there. And sometimes like our chorus or choir rehearsals, that's like doing a 10K. I mean, that's yes. two and a half, three hours of singing. And if I'm not... If I'm not doing, as you said, some of those exercises in between, uh, that's hard. You know, it's hard to do that. If you, you're, you'll be fine. You'll survive. <laughs> Absolutely. But it, but it, it, you won't be as successful as if you were to do that. Yeah. Absolutely. Here's the, the other thing about being in a choir rehearsal or any kind of learning when we're learning music. We tend to learn music and in our choir rehearsals, we tend to uh, uh, learn music in this way. So we learn it, we learn at the music, we sing at it, yeah, right? Yeah. So we tend to do it this way. I just need to stay in tempo. I just need to stay on the beat. I've got to stay with it. I've got to stay with it, right? Oh, so we learn the music this way. And it's nothing against choral directors. This is the way we, this is what we do. And choral directors are doing everything they can to keep this going, but you still have to keep people on time. And we, yeah. learn, we learn to inhale and sing, inhale and sing, inhale and sing, right? Everybody together on the beat. And that's fine. But you need to make sure as a choral singer that you are not doing that in your warm up or in your technical work at home. You have yeah. you must find a way to engender flow and to have a cycle of inhalation, exhalation rather than a cycle of inhale, hold, sing, which is what we do in 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 choirs. And it's and, and it's fine. It's fine. It it. It's part of what we do in choirs to make sure that everybody comes in at the same time. That's fine. Yeah, but. <laughs> I know. But 
long term, if that's the only singing that you're doing and you're not teaching your body the other uh, more fluid, more efficient ways of creating the sound, uh, long term, you, you will not sing uh, as well as you would like for as long as you would like. It's yeah. just not possible. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, th this is great. I, I know that uh, this is a big question for a lot of singers because mm. I think, you know, I, I always think about the difference between a professional and amateur and uh, so many amateurs are just passionate amateurs. And so they're, I, I love their enthusiasm and their, their passion and their drive. And I think that they don't realize that professionals are, are doing a lot of this all the time. You know, they take care of their voice. They take care of their instrument. And uh, they need to be, if they want the same outcome, they need to be doing the same things. That's great. Yeah. Um, and like I said, it doesn't actually take that much time. 10 to 15 minutes a day of intentional work is going to stand you in very good stead. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It, it's retraining your body, it sounds yeah. like, you know, to, to make those good choices. Yeah. 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 So, uh, I mean... I, I kind of looked down for a minute and went, oh my goodness, I can't believe we've already been talking for as long. Like, I, I, I could do this all night. This is, uh, I'm, I'm, I love vocal pedagogy. I love learning more about it. And, uh, but I do want to hit up a couple more questions uh, that I think are important. And I also want time uh, for you to, to talk a little bit more about the, the, the Vocal Instrument 101 and, and, sure. and that too. But what would you feel is like the, 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 the key challenge for vocal pedagogues, like what voice teachers, what, what is like a, a key challenge that, that people are facing? Yeah, um, and I, I wanted to just kind of clarify that uh, when I was thinking about that question as well. When we're, uh, I think we're talking voice teachers here rather than vocal pedagogues of a whole other. Yeah, I think we're talking voice we're teachers. Talking voice talking teachers. Voice yeah, teacher. let's talk voice teachers. Um, so I think challenge may not be the uh i i didn't go at challenge i went uh in that in a slightly different direction and said the three things that i would love and that i work with voice teachers to do uh one is to know what you don't know and stay curious so stay open to the things that you don't know and be very um you know happy and vulnerable to say, you know what, I don't know, and that's fine. And now I'm gonna go find out. <laughs> my cat just Thanks like you. opened the door himself. There we go. <laughs> He's a I'm very smart cat. I'm waiting for my three-year-old to come out at any moment. So. <laughs> I, love <that. laughs> oh, I love it. The other thing that I that I encourage voice teachers, the the teachers that I work with, to do is to. Um, sorry, and what goes along with knowing what you don't know and being open uh, about that is um, uh, being willing to find out the things that you don't know and knowing where to get the resources, right? So where yeah. are those resources? And the second thing that I work with voice teachers on uh, about uh, quite intentionally and far more intentionally now than uh, uh, than I did even two, three years ago, uh, since I started working with a uh, business coach personally, and um, uh, and who's also, who works primarily with voice teachers. Um, so she, and, and so this is something that I'm just passing along to the people that I work with, and, and to know who you want to work with and who you can serve best. So know who you can serve best. Who do you love working with? Who are your ideal clients? If you're, you know, going from a business world, Absolutely. who are your ideal clients? Um, because you will enjoy the teaching and find your flow in your teaching so much more uh, easily, and find that joy so much more easily if you're serving the people that you can serve best. So know that <laughs> there's. Absolutely. When we begin, when we start out, you know, so many of us started out while well, we were talking about this, so many of us start out just because, well, like, I, it would be a way to make some money, either to support my career, my real career, singing, uh, or, you know, or to like, you know, as a, as my hobby, right, as my side, my side hustle, like, so many of us came into it as a side hustle. Well, absolutely. Or, or these people keep coming up saying, you know what, I'd really like a lesson. Do you want, would you, and you're like, oh, okay, I'll, sure. I'll teach. And then suddenly you're a voice teacher, you know, and, and, uh, 
Uh, so yeah, that, and here comes the intentionality again. So we come into teaching and we end up teaching just whoever comes in that front door or who comes into the studio door, which is fine, especially at the beginning. That's absolutely fine. But at some point, start to really think about who do you want to serve? Who can you serve the best? What do you have to offer? And then start to sort of streamline your teaching in that way so that you're doing the thing that is beautiful for you so you're yeah. in your flow you know that's all it, it feels like you have to be quite open to reflect as well on yourself and and to kind of go what are my strengths and what am i good at and and what do i want to be doing and i think you know that stay curious and and be reflective so that you're able to i mean that's fantastic yeah. really fantastic advice and if yeah. you're not a, a reflective person, I'm not, I, I hate self-reflection. <laughs> uh, I'm not a reflective, like, please just let me do the thing. Please don't make me think about the thing. Ah! Uh, <laughs> and I've, if you're not, then get a coach. Yeah, I've <laughs> come, I've come, come to like it only because I like the results, but yes. not the process. Yes. I don't like the process, but I like the results of the process. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Find someone to help you if to help you do the thing. If that's not your thing, yeah. that's totally fine. Yeah. And then the and the last one is is just built into the first one, which is stay open. Just stay yeah. open, yeah. stay curious. Stay open, stay curious. I love yes. that. I love that. That's fantastic. Where, I mean, where do you see vocal pedagogy going? You know, from my experience, uh, at least from my I, I shouldn't say experience, more observation, we've mm -hmm. really seen a dramatic shift to a much more scientific approach for vocal ped, mm -hmm. which personally I love. Um, mm -hmm. when, when I had studied in the past, I'm not saying metaphors are bad or, or not useful, but mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm one of those people where someone will say something and my mind always goes, well, why? You know, and the minute that they kind of talk to me in scientific ways, uh, for me, it actually helps me be more curious as a student, you know, to go, oh, I don't know what those muscles or ligaments or whatever are. I want to study this more or um, yeah. I'll ask more questions. And so, but we're seeing, I think, vocal pedagogy go to a way more scientific approach, which I personally love. But yeah. what is the future? Like, where, where does it go from here? I mean, we found out so much already. Um, yeah. What's next? Uh, that's a great question. And you're absolutely right. We are it's certainly moving into, um, if we haven't already, um, especially at the academic level. So let me just say the sort of higher learning uh, uh, has really embraced in many ways, uh, especially the the universities that have voice ped courses. They've really embraced the, the science, uh, voice science, and... Um, you know, and, and yeah, and, and there are so many very good things to come out of that, uh, very good things. Um, the voice science is trickling down into the sort of independent studios, which is primarily who I work with, independent studio teachers, uh, the independent stu teachers, and it's starting to trickle down. I mean, because it's sort of starting in academia, the voice science applies especially earlier voice science applied to classical singing and adults essentially right because that's who academia was working with right yep. so they're working with like 18 to 25 year olds in yep. classical singing so that's what that's what we looked at we looked at what do you do what what does the tenor do when he goes into upper <laughs> extension how does he what's happening with the nasal passage when you oh, go yeah. into like a high c like that's what we looked at so some of the research that is being done now is starting to trickle down and starting to apply there's certainly much more research that starts to apply to contemporary singing for example uh, music theater styles etc and what we're doing physiologically and what's actually happening in there and this is where a lot of our uh, data around the fact that you know our high level music theater singers and our high level opera singers are being injured at the same rate it's not a different rate of injury here friends like just because you're singing classically doesn't mean you're 
you're like healthier than our music theater belters. It's the same mm-hmm. rate of injury. And our music theater belters, by the way, are singing nine shows a week. When was the last time an opera singer sang nine shows in a week? Never, never, not once <laughs> has an opera singer sung nine shows in a week. It just Absolutely. doesn't happen. So Absolutely. there's a difference there in terms of vocal usage. That's a whole other thing. So we're starting to get contemporary and music theater styles um, researched as well as the research into um, uh, applicable research, I should say, applicable research and how to apply this research for an independent teacher who's working with Mm -hmm. eight-year-olds, 13-year-olds, you know, every style, every, you know, you name it, exactly. And also who are working with our aging population, right? So they're working with the choral singers, Choral singers are singing in independent studios. That's who they're working oh, with. Absolutely, so. and and also I imagine vocal rehabilitation mm-hmm. and and that industry. Mm-hmm. I, sh- I I don't I hate using the term industry. It sounds yeah. so, but but that kind of uh, 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 I don't know. I'm just saying with industry. Area. <laughs> but but it, it, it seems to have really uh, benefited so dramatically mm-hmm. from this. I mean. Um, you know, speech language pathologists uh, and and uh, ENTs, and I, I mean, obviously they had a, a lot of this information already. But it seems like we're all working together now, as yeah. opposed to uh, people in different streets. Certainly, yeah, certainly, uh, it is all better than it has been ever before in history. That is, yes, exactly. Awesome. I, I'll I'll put one caveat in there. If I had a teacher who knew all of the science and knew how to apply it, but didn't have good ears versus a teacher who had good ears and had every metaphor on the planet, but couldn't understand why those metaphors worked. I would take that teacher over that teacher any day of the week. What I want is a teacher who understands the science, understands how to apply it and understands why the metaphors work and why the imagery works and understands how how to teach it and has good ears. That's what I want. I want that teacher, right? The best of both worlds. <laughs> yeah, that's the best of both worlds. But uh, that's my that's my only caveat. Yeah, that's fair. Knowing that's the really science fair. does not make you a good teacher. Yeah. No, absolutely. I, I, I think the same. My, my experience with uh, choral conductors was similar. Yeah. You know, one of the things I always wished they had talked a lot more about at the university level uh, with choral conductors was interpersonal relationships, you know? <laughs> uh, so you can wave your arms as much as you want. You could get a doctorate in this, but <laughs> if I don't want to sing for you, you don't have a chorus or choir. So, you know, uh, it's, it's the same kind of thing. You, you want the exactly. best of both worlds. Yeah, uh, I mean, this has been, uh, I, I really value the time that, that we've had to, to chat tonight. And mm. uh, I know there's been a, a bunch of cool comments and things like that and oh, cool. uh, some questions. And um, I know that, that people would totally want to do this again in the future and, and learn more. Awesome. But in the meantime, uh, before I'm going to finish with one final question, but yep. where can people find you on the socials? Where can they find you? <laughs> Yeah. I, I just actually said socials. Uh, yeah, all the socials. I, I don't know what it means, but I've heard. <laughs> but, but where can they find you? And and talk a little bit about uh, talk a little bit about your program as well, and how they can find all of that information. Sure. Well, you know what? I don't even really need to talk about it. I'll just say, if you go to my website, shannon-coats.com, it's not my favorite website at the moment. Fine, but whatever. It has the information. I really liked it. Oh, anyway, it has the information, and <laughs> there's, you know, there are other there are links to to you know other things that I do on there, the blogs on there, and uh, information about the courses there, and and you can also sign up for the mailing list there. So that's likely the best way to sort of stay on, on top of things is uh, through the mailing list. Yeah. Um, and then if you are on Facebook and you like Facebook, then go to the Vocal Instrument 101, and and I throw lots and lots of stuff up, stuff up on Instagram as well. So And the Vocal Instagram. Instrument 101, just so everyone knows, is basically the online... Uh, course right so, so that, that is yeah. a course that you can and that's geared for voice teachers um yeah it's geared for voice teachers and uh and 
voice users, uh, especially singers, so adult singers, who want to understand a little bit more about, it's essentially the first term of an undergraduate voice ped course, just sort of smushed into, it's about five hours long in like 20 minute segments. And you can just go through it at your own pace. You go to the website and you blah, 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 blah. And the, the Facebook page is, I disseminate a ton of information on there and I go live on there and talk and stuff like that. Absolutely. So the Facebook page, is the vocal vocal instrument 101 and then the course you can take a look at it on my website so and again the website is shannon and it's hyphen right dash yeah, shannon dash coats yeah at dot com and and uh yeah I'll, I'll tell you like i've i've been following along and uh especially the vocal instrument 101 on facebook and it, it just the information that you give out is fantastic and i love just how real you are as a person like yeah. uh, the the reading even reading and being honest about not liking tim horton's coffee uh on your website uh right away made me love you more i just <laughs> this is like like i don't get me wrong i i love you know uh i go to tim horton's i i don't always drink their coffee um oh. But uh, but we usually just make our own at home. We have a really good coffee maker, and I think you have the same. So. Uh huh. Uh huh. I've got a great latte maker, <laughs> espresso awesome. maker. I love it. I love it so so the, the the big kind of last question that that I've asked uh, the last interview, and and I kind of want it to be the the last question of of my interviews is like, what impact do you want to have on the world? And I I feel like we've learned some of that, but I love. <laughs> I love your thoughts on that. Oh, it's such a great question. Um, so the singers that I work with, the voice teachers that I work with, the voice pros that I work with generally come back and say, I love using my voice again. I love singing again. I found a way to teach again that I found a way, I found some information that's helping me and invigorating my teaching, my singing, my speaking. So that uh, voice use and uh, finding the joy in voice use again is, I mean, that that that's everything. That's just everything. And so the impact uh, in terms of a broader concept, the impact for me, I think, is just how many more people can I, um, in my sphere of influence, can, uh, can I help find the mechanics for their small V voice so that they can engage their big V voice, right? So the, the, the real voice, so that they can actually use their real voice uh, in impactful ways. I love yeah. that. I love that. And, and I think that, you know, it's, it's obvious that you're doing that already. And, and what's great about that is that you're kind of following, you know, your purpose. And, mm -hmm. and that's, that's wonderful. It, it, mm -hmm. it, you know, talking about intention, you know, mm -hmm. it really feels like you have intention as to what you want to do and how you want to mm -hmm. impact people. You're mm -hmm. doing that already. And, but also finding different avenues to do that in different ways, you know, yeah. bringing it to the masses online on Facebook, giving, mm -hmm. I mean, on Facebook, you're, all this information that you give out is free. It's just there, and and uh, you know teaching and it's just wonderful. And and I really just appreciate your time talking tonight and uh, uh, you being able to share all of this wisdom with with everyone else. I think that's fantastic. Fantastic. Oh, thanks so much, Darren. That was great. It was great. Yeah, I'm so I, I, glad you I, reached I, out. <laughs> I'm, yeah, and I'm, I'm just so really thankful that, that you said, yeah, sure, yes, I'm going to do this. <laughs> and uh, I really hope that we get the opportunity to do this again and uh, work together in the future. I mean, I love it. it's wonderful to have someone of your expertise so close. So, yeah, yeah absolutely. Thank you so much. My uh, pleasure. For your time. And uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, maybe doing this again in the future. I love it. All right. Take care. <laughs> Take care. Bye.